It was Jesus himself who said, If you continue in my words, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Can you say an amen out there? I want to make to you four promises. Promise number one is the Bible is going to be the bedrock of our study. The reason is the Bible means what it says and says just what it means. Promise number two, you are going to be enlightened irrespective of who you are. Promise number three, you are going to be challenged to make the most important decision of your life. Promise number four, your life and mine will never be the same. Our subject, our broader theme, timeless leadership insight for today's leaders. Our subject, specifically for today, let's rise and build the impact of a gifted leader. Let's rise and build the impact of a gifted leader. We stopped last in the book of um, Nehemiah chapter 1. We are there and uh, we notice that Nehemiah prayed. He asked God to solve the problem of his people. Nehemiah was a man who was concerned about his people and he was someone who translated his concern into prayer. Today we're heading to Nehemiah chapter 2. And if you recall, maybe let me just give a little a hint that this study, you can glean your own useful lesson as well as you study the book of Nehemiah. Uh, God can impress truth on your mind and heart in a unique way. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 2. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. But I want to focus on chapter 2 verse 1. Nehemiah said he was there in the month of Nisan. If you recall, in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 1, the Bible says, in the words of, the, of, of Nehemiah, the son of uh, Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chishlu. So Nehemiah was concerned about his people's issue. His prayer was made, all those stuff. It was in the month of Chishlu. Now in chapter 2 verse 1, we are told it was in the month of Nisan. Chishlu today will be like our November. And Nisan will be our March. So when you put it together, within four months, from Chisliu to Nisan, from November to March, Nehemiah was in prayer. Nehemiah brought his supplication before the God of heaven, before he can make any statement to the king of Persia. He may even have done his best to conceal his pain. You see, for patient subjects, they were expected to be perfectly happy in the presence of the king. In other words, when they see a kind of abnormal attitude, a kind of a weird demeanor, a kind of a drowsy face, the king calls and find out, maybe because many persons in, in those days could cause what we call today, could deter. So something must be troubling you. The king doesn't want a, a, a very drowsy personality in his presence. You must be in your best of mood before the king. So the king noticed Nehemiah was not happy. If you listen, Nehemiah says, I took wine and gave the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Now Nehemiah was in sorrow. Now he was in pain. And the Bible says, look at Nehemiah chapter 2. I'm referring now to verse number 2. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad since you have not been sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. But you see, before Nehemiah will begin to speak to the king of the world, he spent time to do deeper reflection. What, what, what I intend to say concerning Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 1 up to verse 2 is that from the month of Chislew to the month of Nisan, Nehemiah spent deeper time reflecting, 
thinking about the problem before he could go to the king of the world. Nehemiah spent time to think through the issues. So while the king saw that Nehemiah was sick and said, look, why are you sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. Did you hear that? Nehemiah became shocked. The king has noticed my situation. The king has seen that I am not happy. The reason why he's afraid is that he could be executed. Look at the match chapter 2 verse 3 for the sake of time. And the king said, and I said to the king, may the king live forever. That is to say, king, please, you have my allegiance. Please, you still have my support. M M Mr. King, it, 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 it is well with you. I am still your faithful servant. But he said in his statement, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad, king? When the city, when the place of my fathers, my father's tomb, they lie waste and its gates are ruined with fire. King, I have every right to be sad. Forgive me. Why shouldn't I be sad, Mr. President? When my father's tomb lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Do you understand what is going on? Nehemiah had prudence and foresight. Look, instead of saying whilst Jerusalem was in ruin, Nehemiah, he, he personalized the problem. He said, Mr. King, I am sad. I am sad because my father's tomb lies waste. The gates are burned. He's refer in that we say that leaders must have prudence and they must have foresight. You can't get it. In the book of the Watchman, the Southern Watchman, uh, March 8, 1904, the pen of inspiration said with trembling lips and tearful eyes, he revealed the cause of his sorrow. The touching recital awakened the sympathy of the monarch without arousing his idolatrous prejudices. So Nehemiah was a communicator par excellence. Whilst he spoke, Ellen White said his heart was trembled. Nehemiah was with a teary eye. He literally wanted to cry. It's like, Mr. President, why won't I be sad? He, he, he knew how to put up his case. Leaders today must know how to speak with prudence. They must know how to speak with candor. But they must know how to speak wisely in the choice of his words. Nehemiah chapter 2, look at verse 4. Then the king said to me, why do you request? What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Mm. Did you hear that? Nehemiah understood that the, the future of Jerusalem lies in his answer. The king asked him, Nehemiah, why? Why are you sad? Why, why, what is your request? What do you need? Whilst the king asked Nehemiah, what do you need? Nehemiah quickly said, a prayer. He petitioned the God of heaven. He's not a person who trusts in his, just his eloquence, his antics and his skills. Nehemiah brought his issue before the God of heaven. Here is the point. Leaders must know the source of transformational leadership. It's not about our skills. It's not about our propensity to, 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 to play games. No. He knows that everything depends on God. So I prayed to the God of heaven. And then why says in the same Southern Watchman 1904 that, look, as he prayed, a holy purpose had been forming in his mind from the month of Chislew to the month of Nisan, that if he could obtain the consent of the king, he entreated the Lord to grant him favor in the sight of the king that his cherished plan might be carried out. 
Nehemiah was literally saying, if God could grant me grace, in that brief prayer, Nehemiah pressed his case before the presence of the king of kings and enlisted on his side a power that can turn the hearts of the rivers of water as they are turned. Nehemiah literally was asking heaven, let God dispatch his angels to come to speak to this idolatrous king, Artaxerxes. Let Artaxerxes understand the implication of my request. And then why says in the book, uh, Royalty and Rune, page 202, that he pleaded that God will support the cause of Israel. Restore their courage and strength and help them build the devastated city. As Nehemiah prayed, his faith and courage, they grew. So Nehemiah knew, I need God on my side. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 5. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your side, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tomb, that I may rebuild it. Did you notice that? See what Nehemiah said. Please, Mr. King, if it is your wish, I'm at your service. But my request is, may I find favor in your sight. Allow me to go to Judah. I will explain what he means by that. To the city of my father's tomb, that I may rebuild it. Nehemiah, he never used the name Jerusalem. Our subjects, let's rise and build. You see, in the book of Ezra chapter 4, if you watch carefully, you see, when we are leaders, we need to be smart. We need to be thoughtful. It hinted that there was an obstruction in the days of Ezra by act of success, that the city should not be built. People petition him. Look at Ezra chapter 4. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 12 and look at verse 16. Ezra 4 verse 8. Rehum, the commander in Shimshai, the scribe wrote a letter against Jerusalem. Against what? Jerusalem. Nehemiah said, I want to go to Judah. He never mentioned Jerusalem. So Rehum and the commander in Shimshai, the scribe wrote a letter against Jerusalem to King Artaxerxes in this fashion. This is what they wrote. From Rehum, the commander, Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their companions, representatives of the uh, dynasties. The, it continues, then verse 10, and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Osnapa took captive and settled in the cities of Samaria, and the remainder beyond the river, and so forth. Verse 11, this is a copy of the letter that was sent. Look at verse 12, the letter was written. Let it be known to the king, the Jews who came up from you, have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are furnishing its walls and repairing the foundation. Let it be known to the king that if the city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax, tributes, or customs, and the king's treasury will be diminished. Now, because we receive support from the palace, it was not proper for us to see the king's dishonor. Look at this propagandists. Therefore, we have sent and informed the king. Mr. King, we are sending this letter. Look, the people who you have led to come to their uh, uh, country or their city, Jerusalem, they are now rebuilding the wall. If this is done, we are not going to have tax anymore. Because we receive tax from the king, we can't keep quiet. We can't allow this to keep going. So they said, let the king search in the books, the records of your fathers. And you will find in the books, the records, they are writing the letter. So they are saying to the king, Ezra 4 verse 15, let the king search in the books of his fathers. And the king will find out, they said the king, you will find out in the book of the records. And know that this city is a rebellious city. Which city? Jerusalem. It's a harmful city. It's harmful to kings and provinces that they have incited sedition within the city in former times, for which they caused the city was destroyed. So why was the city destroyed? They said because the city has caused commotion, problems, seditions, and it has been a problem for former kings. We inform the king that if the city is built or rebuilt and it was completed, 
The result will be that you will have no dominion beyond the river. The king sent an answer. Look at the king's report. Then the king eventually said, let the city not be built. So Nehemiah knew this. He was a historian. You see, leaders must be readers. Leaders must know the historical antecedent. If you want to be a change maker, you need to read and know. Nehemiah knew this. So whilst Nehemiah was before the king, Nehemiah knew that, look, I don't need to use the word Jerusalem. I don't need to let that word fall on my lips. Look at the king's response to the accusation against Jerusalem. Why Nehemiah was using Judah, my father's tomb, instead of Jerusalem. Look at Ezra chapter 4, verse 19 to verse 22. The Bible says, verse 18, the letter which you sent to me, the king is writing, has been clearly read before me, and I gave the command, and a search has been made. And it was found that the city is, in former times has revolted against kings, uh, and rebellion and sedition have been fostered in it. There have also been mighty kings over Jerusalem, who have ruled over all the region beyond the river, and tax tribute and customs were paid to them. Now give the command to make these men cease, uh, that the city may not be built until the command is given by me. Take heed. Now, that you do not fail to do this, why should damage increase to the hurt of the kings? Actus responded. So with this, you could know that Nehemiah understood the game plan. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 2. Let's go to verse number 5. He made a request. Listen to what the king said. So Nehemiah is saying that, look, I don't want to use Jerusalem. He understood that the entire use, the use of the word Jerusalem will be deadly for the king granting his request. He understood the implication of his actions. I wish that the leaders of Africa will understand the implication when they are before the rulers of other first world, second world nations. They need to know how to use communication back with history so that they can know how to make their case for the support of the continent or for trade instead of aid. Leadership must know what to say, when to say it, how to say it for the good of the people. Nehemiah chapter 2 is our object of study. Our subject, timeless leadership insight for today's leaders. And the subheading for this one, let's rise and build. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 6, the Bible says, Then the king said to me, after the request, and they said, The queen also sitting beside him, How long will your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a set time. As a leader, Nehemiah teaches that before you bring your case Maybe you are looking for funding. Maybe you are looking for... A leader must have developed a definite timeline. You see, Nehemiah came before the king. Imagine the king has asked Nehemiah, when do you intend to return? And he said, I've not thought about it. Nonsense. Forgive my words. Serious? It doesn't make sense. Have you thought through your plan? So the Bible says, the king asked me, how long will you be returning? How long will your journey be, sorry, and when will you be returning? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Wow! Nehemiah knew what he needed. Nehemiah understood that, look, he needed time. I set him a time. Nehemiah probably mentions uh, uh, maybe a year or two. I'm just guessing. Such a space will, will, will be tolerated by the monarch. He stayed away. However, we read Nehemiah chapter 5 verse 14 for 12 years. But Nehemiah had given the king when the work will be done. Maybe he wants to take a leave of absence. When the Bible says the queen was also sitting by him, what does it mean? What is the meaning of that? Look at Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 7. We're going to pull all together for the sake of time. 
Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they may permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temples for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. Look at the way he's putting it. He's talking about, please, Mr. King, I need, I, I, I need permission. I need a presidential escort. Not just a presidential escort, Mr. President, I need favor. I need wood. Please grant me, according to the good hand of, of, of my God upon me. Look at how Nehemiah put it. He said, give me a letter to Asa. Aside Asa, I need timber from the forest so that I can build the walls and the temple. Then where I will stay. He is talking about his welfare. He knows the king will fall to that. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of God that is upon me. Here is the point. Leaders must know the specific variables needed to fulfill the vision. Which vision do you have in life? What do you need to fulfill it? Let's take, for example, let's take you are in charge of a business. You are in charge of a ministry. You are in charge of a country. You are in charge of a project. Have you sat through from your month of Chishliu to your month of Nisan, thought through, plan, how much do we need? What do we need? What are the human resources? What advantage do I need? What must I leverage? May I knew all the variables needed to make his work successful. Do you know that as a leader? Nehemiah teaches us, it's not enough to pray. It's not enough to be concerned. But we also need to think, think through whatever vision the Lord has given us. Have prepared answers. The story is told of a group of people who wanted to build a radio station. And they are looking for funding. And they asked them, how much do you need to complete the radio station? They could not give. In the boardroom, they were asked that, can you be excused? That was the end of it. How much do we need to make, an Afri to make Africa a first world country? How much do we need as a church to be able to finish the work in our generation? How much do we need to make our country stand out when others stand? How can we make our railways best, the roads best, the hospital first class, our ac ac academic environment? Top notch among all. How much do we need for the project? Has the Lord given you a vision? Has the Lord laid a burden on you? Have you sat down? Have you counted the costs? Nehemiah teaches us leaders don't only pray. They don't only wish. They don't only desire. They don't only speak. They also have detailed plan in their pocket. And when needed, they flaunt it out. Nehemiah chapter 2. We're going to verse number 9. Nehemiah chapter 2. Verse number nine. Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king has sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sambalat and the Horan and Tobiah, the Ammonite officials, heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well being of the children of Israel. Nehemiah's vision was simple I want to repair, I want to rebuild. I want to reinforce. What do I mean? He wants to repair the wallowing identity of Israel. He wants to rebuild the broken down walls. He wants to reinforce the precept of God. That was all what he needed. That was all he wanted to do. He wanted to call the people to rise up and build. But the Bible says immediately, Nehemiah attempted with the escorts to come to do this good work. Sambalat, the Horonite. Tobiah, the Ammonite official, when they heard of it, they were deeply disturbed. They were grieved. Even before Nehemiah started the work, there was opposition. Brace and prepare for opposition. Opposition should be one of the things you should budget for as a leader. Has the Lord called you for something? Prepare and be ready for the opposition. Who is he? Nobody has done it before. What does he think he wants to do? 
People are just angry. Why were they angry? Look at verse 10 very carefully. The Bible says they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. That tells you the spirit that lead persons like this. Satanic spirit. Evil spirit governs them because they can't just understand why should such a person come to seek the welfare of the people. In other words, they prefer the world should remain ruined. They wish the broken walls will never be repaired. That is their desire. That is their will. And that is their wish. Expect opposition. As I wrap up, Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 12. Then I rose in the night. I and a few men with me I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. In there, I find something very unique. Verse 13, and I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and the refuse gate and view the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and eat gates which were burned with fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool and there was no room for the animals under me to pass. The point is this. Nehemiah, when he's talking about uh, the valley gate, it's a gate at the western or the western or the southwest side of Jerusalem. What was he attempting to do? There, Nehemiah teaches us a unique secret. Know the right time for your assessment. If you watch very carefully, Nehemiah said, look, Nehemiah chapter 2, you read verse 11. Verse 12, verse 13, in fact, even up to verse 15, as I wrap up this particular one, it says, So I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall. Then I returned and entreated by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. So he, in short, Nehemiah was teaching us, know the right time for your assessment. When you are called to do something for the Lord, and you needed to know the problem statement deeper. Remember in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 2, it was Hanani, one of the brethren, who told Nehemiah what the problem was. Now, he might have sent people to find out for him. Now that he has come to the city, he wants to find for himself what things are like. Ladies and gentlemen, transformational leadership happens when we have leaders who are gifted, who are willing to change the status quo and become the leaders God indeed desire. Can I ask you today, in your leadership experience, do you know the right timing? In your leadership experience, are you sure you anticipate opposition? In your leadership experience, are you indeed sure you are aware, you know the specific variables that are needed to fulfill the vision. Are you sure in your leadership quest or experience, you have a, a developed definite timelines on how things can work? Nehemiah teaches us, these are critical variables. These are serious variables that are needed so that the walls can be built within a record time. But more importantly, in this session, Nehemiah teaches us that look, we need to know not just how to plan, how to do this. We need to have a historical antecedent. We need to know what to say. We need to know how to say it when we are before the monarch. And by that we say, we need to know the source of transformational leadership. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you so much in the powerful name of Jesus. Lord, help our country. Help our church. Help us as individuals. Help our country. Help our community. May we be like Nehemiah. May we become the change makers. May we be the change the world is looking for. Teach us, Lord, to imbibe these principles so that we can change our communities. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ, I pray.